So let me take a moment to introduce our speaker, whom for many of you requires no introduction at all, as David has been a central figure in all of our work for many, many years. And it's a great pleasure to have uh, and privilege to be able to introduce him. David Prescott works now as the Director of Professional Development and as a Clinical Director for Beckett Family Services. He's, which is devoted to building healthy lives and safe communities. He has produced 13 book projects and numerous articles and chapters in the areas of assessing and treating sexual violence and trauma. Uh, David is the past president of the Association for Treatment of Sexual Abusers, uh, or ATSA. And also, I'm pleased to let any of you know who don't already that he was the 2014 recipient of that organization's Distinguished Contribution Award. And he's only one of a handful of recipients to receive it. And previous to that, he received the Bright Lights, excuse me, award from the National Adolescent Perpetrator Network in 2007. David is a certified trainer, trainer for the International Center for Clinical Excellence and a member of the Motivational Inter Interviewing Network of Trainers. He's lectured around the world, and I get tired just thinking about this, including most recently in Australia, Japan, Germany, Iceland, Poland, Romania, Canada, and the UK. He serves on the editorial boards of two scholarly journals, Motivational Interviewing, Training, Research, Implementation, and Practice, and the Journal of Sexual Aggression. And uh, just before uh, we turn this over to David, uh, I want to highlight one of the books that um, he and Robin Wilson have uh, created called Awakening Motivation for Difficult Changes. And the book describes how clinicians and other professionals can help to motivate adult clients who have been mandated into treatment. Uh, David and, and Robin Wilson deal directly with motivation, setting the stage for the preparatory stages of change. And this workbook provides the concrete steps for a client to examine and address uh, in terms of the barriers to effective treatment and ultimately to positive change. David, it's a real pleasure to have you. Thank you. And I'm going to turn this over to you for the actual webinar. All right. Very good. Okay. Well, welcome. It's always uh, marvelous to get a chance to uh, share my passion uh, with other people and uh, motivational interviewing has uh, uh, been one of my passions for about 12 years now. So I'm just going to start. Uh, you heard Steve Benjes talk about uh, a recent workbook I did with Robin Wilson. So I thought I'd just put a picture uh, uh, of him up uh, for those that haven't had the opportunity to meet Robin uh, or see him train. Um, he is uh, he is a force of nature and he also plays guitar with a group called Audiophilia, um, which is uh, also known as At's His House Band. So anyway, Robin and I do a, a great deal of work together, and I'm very grateful to his contributions to our workbook. So moving right along, I thought I'd, uh, I'd start with a conversation uh, that took place in Bucharest, Romania last October. I had done a, some training on the Good Lives model and uh, sort of um, what's commonly known as Sex Offender 101. And uh, I put up some facts and figures. And uh, at the end of the day, a, a very thoughtful and competent therapist named Georgia um, uh, said something to the effect of, you know, you talked all day, David, about how people change, but you never really talked all that much about why people change. And uh, I thought it was an excellent point. Um, she said, so why do people change? And I found myself in uh, you know, a little bit tongue-tied and saying something um, not very elegant like, geez, um, I'll have to think about that. Uh, or things like this. And it, it occurred to me on the flight back that uh, very often in our field, we don't spend a lot of time examining the, the why as well as the how of change. And motivational interviewing is, uh, is very much uh, about that. If you can answer the question, uh, when it's midnight and your client is tossing and turning in bed and thinking about his life, what's going through his mind? you might have some kind of uh, an idea as to what is this person's um, internal motivation for change. And so motivational interviewing ultimately is about the, uh, the why as well as the how of change. And um, again, just a, a quick welcome for any newcomers. Um, if you've been to a training like this before, one of my great beliefs is that you should attend um, probably five or six uh, basic trainings for every, uh, for every advanced skills training that you attend. So 
Very good. So part of my story uh, uh, begins here, thinking in terms of motivation, internal motivation, motivational interviewing, and people who get in trouble for their sexual behavior in one way or another. Um, a lot of what we do goes back to the 1960s and, uh, and before. I have some articles uh, from the 1950s um, on the topic, but really the women's movement in the 1960s. If I had to start our, uh, our field at any one point, this would be it, along with the work of Kurt Freund uh, developing the penile plethysmograph. And um, many, uh, I think, uh, w whenever I look at this picture, I, I think I might be able to see my mother um, somewhere uh, often in one of the corners that um, she uh, she certainly worked uh, in this area and like many at the time worked to bring the problem of sexual abuse to a wider audience and so many of us um, started with uh, many of the earliest feminist writings there was one that claimed that um, I think it was in the mid 1970s that, uh, that because of male patriarchal society there's no such thing as uh, consensual sex or truly cons consensual sex and I always thought that might be taking it a little bit far, but it, I certainly take the point that, uh, that the issue had arrived and it was time for it to be discussed um, in, the, uh, in the public arena. And so many people got together and did exactly what they do when, um, when they're experiencing any kind of turmoil or anguish or pain in their life. They got together and talked about the things that were, that were bothering them. And so it is in our field, as you can see on, on the screen. This is a photograph of one of the very first uh, ATSA conferences. And if you've, um, uh, you might, some of you might recognize some of the people in the room. That's uh, Gene Abel, and you can see Rob Longo over there on the right, as well as um, a kind of ancient uh, technology um, that I think might go back to before the Civil War. It's called uh, an overhead projector. But th this is how our field started. We didn't know what we were doing. And things didn't always turn out all that well, but we were bound and determined to find some of the answers. Were, they, were these clients mad? Were they bad? Were they personality disordered or mentally Ooh. ill? If we read some books, we were told that sex offenders were driven by power and control, and others would say they were driven by sexual deviance, and uh, nobody seemed to agree, but we did want to start doing some research. And so the people on this, uh, in this photo were some of the uh, true pioneers in our field. And after some basic research, we decided that there really are many motivations for sexually abusive behavior. Um, one of them is, uh, is sexual. Some people abuse because of a specific sexual gratification related to abuse. We used to describe this as sexual deviance. Many of us still do. English is a living language, and I have some concerns about this kind of, uh, this kind of language. I prefer to think of it as maybe abuse-related sexual interests. In any event, I find it difficult to go up to my clients and accuse them of sexual deviance, or at least if I am going to use that kind of language, I'm, I'm very well aware that I'm probably going to be inviting some distance between, uh, between me and them. We also, through research, came to find that there are many people who abuse uh, as a result of non-sexual motivations that, uh, frankly, some people are mean, some people are drunk, some people tried to prevent abuse, but lack the skills to prevent it in the heat of the moment. Um, and some people simply choose sexual partners that are uh, uh, inappropriate or unable to, uh, unable to consent. So what research has really driven home is there really are many motivations and that perhaps one of the primary answers to the, to the why of change is that there's a vast difference between where they are and where they want to be in their lives. Something to think about. So uh, something else that I believe has influenced our field was this classic article in 1974 by Robert Martinson. Um, I was actually just in Poland recently as well and um, listened to a lecture in which uh, somebody, uh, even in Warsaw, was uh, was 
talking about the, the lasting effects of this article from 1974. In it, uh, Robert Martinson asked, does nothing work in reducing criminal behavior as a result of our prison-based or correctional rehabilitation programs? It became known as the nothing works uh, doctrine. And the first evidence that would show that Martinson was wrong came along the, uh, uh, the very next year in 1975. But by this point, Martinson was a very famous man who uh, hit the talk show circuit. And this one paper made uh, uh, sort of got onto the international stage and was discussed uh, just about everywhere. Martinson cast a long shadow over our field for a long time and actually tried to retract this article in 1979, but, uh, but unsuccessfully. Um, when you say that you were wrong, you don't make the international media as when you say nothing works. And it would take many years for the harm of this, uh, of this paper uh, to actually be undone. And I would argue that it still hasn't uh, been undone for reasons that I'll explain in just a moment. By the time the 1980s came around, we had a better research base, but still not perfect. And many of us believed that sex offenders, so-called, were destined to a lifetime of havoc and destruction. Many of us uh, read a lot of Gene Abel's research, for example, and might have gotten a little bit confused about um, some of the statistical methodology, um, confusing the, mo the, the mode, the median, and the mean, for example. And um, there were many, uh, many problems with this that led to a lot of mistaken conclusions about who our clients actually were. More recently, there's been any number of debates about whether or not treatment is even effective. The, uh, the first major review done by Furby and her colleagues in 1989 actually found there was no overall differences between treated and untreated uh, people who had sexually abused. Uh, but they also said that this was primarily due to much of the methodology used. Um, this study, too, became quite influential, although I took out a copy of it the other day. And I think anybody that would read it now would say that our field has uh, has come come quite a long way. It still gets to the uh, question, though, about the how and the why of people who do change, because people do, uh, over the course of their lives, uh, change quite a bit. What we've since found is that for people who've sexually abused and are able to successfully complete treatment programs, their reoffense rates are typically significantly less than those who receive no treatment or who are uh, unable to complete treatment for whatever reason. Um, one, uh, one study came along by Carl Hansen and his colleagues in 2002. It wasn't perfect, but it showed a 40% reduction in reoffense rates amongst people who were able to complete treatment. More recently, Carl Hansen and his colleagues also found that the principles of risk and need and responsivity seem to be amongst uh, uh, the hallmarks of the most successful treatment programs. And, and uh, I, defining those terms uh, is perhaps a different topic for another day. But I will say that the responsivity principle really speaks to the question of how much we're seriously, meaningfully engaging our client in our treatment program. Programs. And then there was the SOTEP study, which you can use to either argue that treatment can work or that treatment doesn't work. Overall, people who simply went through the treatment program didn't seem to reoffend at any lower rates, while those who successfully and meaningful, uh, meaningfully completed their treatment goals really did reoffend at lower rates. And so I think one of the take home messages from this study, which was uh, statistically extremely well done, is that, it, that change is really about completing a, a personally relevant, personally meaningful uh, set of treatment goals rather than simply going through uh, uh, a treatment program and everybody basically doing the same thing. If I were to compile all of the research together, it would um, echo the words of uh, my friends uh, Gwenda Willis and Doug Bauer, who uh, say that the sex offender, or the safest sex offender, is somebody who's stable in their life, somebody who's occupied, somebody who's got supportive people in his or her life to whom they're accountable, has a plan for the future, and has everything to lose by repeating a sexual assault. 
So you might be asking at this point, what the heck does all of this have to do with motivational interviewing? And my answer is that very often our treatment programs have taken on a very harsh and confrontational approach. Oftentimes in response to the harsh and confrontational societal pressures that uh, many of us live under, we're all under constant pressure to get the job done, to get our documentation complete, and for goodness sake, to reduce risk um, as quickly and as efficiently as possible. And we, uh, it's easy to forget what my uh, good friend Joanne Schladel always says, which is that sometimes the slower we go in treatment, the faster we actually get to our destination. So one of the uh, conclusions I've come to after watching years of enhanced restrictions on uh, adult and juvenile sexual offenders uh, alike is I've decided that I need to be the person who finds a way to give options to clients when all other options have been taken away. Increasingly, I think it's really important for all of us to find ways to make our clients' voices heard in our treatment plans, in our treatment provision, and to really individualize our uh, uh, treatment, uh, treatment goals. This is, uh, this is something called an options menu. And for me in motivational interviewing, it's my favorite place to start. It can be as simple as circles on a page where you can write in uh, whatever various treatment goals you might have on behalf of a client, leave some of them blank, and then ask the client how these fit uh, with that particular client. As some of you might be aware, sometimes the language of risk assessment is not necessarily the best language for treatment. And although a risk assessment co may come back saying that somebody is sexually preoccupied or has intimacy deficits, we'll want to change that language without changing the, the fundamental sort of underlying concepts of what it is that we're trying to treat in adherence with the need principle. And so one of the ways that I go about this is trying to get the client's voice into an options menu in terms of what kinds of things are going to be meaningful to him or her, and how can we craft that into a goal that will be somehow related to uh, a dynamic risk factor, um, if at all possible. Another good tool that um, obviously I should pause here and say I'm compacting about two days of training into, uh, into about a half an hour or 40 minutes of presentation. And so I know that I will have done my job if you're curious to find out more about motivational interviewing. Um, you can certainly feel free to contact me, uh, contact me or the folks at, uh, at NERI um, offline. So I'm describing some of these skills very quickly and um, hoping that you will uh, go back and get the uh, 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 get the uh, the recording of this webinar or um, uh, approach me for articles uh, or do any of that stuff before you actually spend money on books. Uh, but I encourage doing that as well. <laughs> so this is a uh, is what's commonly called a readiness ruler. And it's really, really simple. You ask somebody on a scale of zero to 10 how important a certain change target is in their lives. And then on a scale of zero to 10, how confident they are that they could make changes in this area. And um, it may seem overly simplified, but, uh, but there's a couple of uh, uh, things to do with this. So that if your client says, well, it's really important for me to have good relationships, I'd score myself as a, uh, as a 10. And then I ask, how confident are you that you could um, build better relationships? And my client says two. Then uh, I've got some additional information that I can use. And then I might actually ask what's known as the backwards question, which is, um, you know, two wasn't very high. And I'm really interested to know, why didn't you score yourself zero? Or if you want to be a little bit dramatic, you could even say, why not a negative one? And see what they have to say. When you ask why they didn't score themselves lower, 
very often what you get is some real keys to their underlying motivation. Things like, well, I really want to have good relations or, you know, I've been able to have good relationships in the past or I have really good reasons to build better relationships. Or finally, I have some real needs to develop better relationships if I'm ever going to, going to truly prevent reoffense. So this can be a useful tool that, uh, that we may come back to. But ultimately, my takeaway message from all of this up to this point is that human beings change. Um, as you can tell from my uh, uh, gray hair, I didn't exactly grow up in the era of DSM-5. And I can remember when things like borderline personality, um, it, when I was in a master's program, I was told that this was uh, immutable and fixed explicitly across the lifespan. And now the most recent edition of the DSM talks about uh, the fact that it really does remit, and they, they talk about five-year remission rates, et cetera. People do change, especially adolescents, in ways that we very often can't understand um, or predict. And the parents who are listening to this uh, know exactly what I mean. Ultimately, all of the research has shown us time again that punishment-only approaches simply don't work. They don't reduce re-offense. They uh, might make uh, professionals um, feel as though they're doing their job in the moment, but ultimately they're ineffective. We don't need any more research in this area. This is really clearly established. And I'm going to add that when all else fails, that we should get back to the human, uh, get to the back to the very basics of human communication. So, the uh, some of the, the the bottom line messages from uh, from motivational interviewing is that we should be thinking about change talk. How do we listen for the language of change? If we, for example, were listening to Amy Winehouse as a client, I realize it's something of a tragic example. She's the one that told us she didn't want to go to rehab. No, no, no. And she said the word no, I don't know, 25 times or more in the course of that, of the song Rehab, big hit single. But um, on only one occasion, she said she didn't ever want to drink again and that she just wanted a friend. So our job is to listen for these little micro cues of any kind of desire, ability, reason, or need to change. That's the, uh, that's the real pay dirt in this uh, kind of work. Clearly, we need to go about our business in a state of acceptance that, um, that uh, even though none of us accept or tolerate sexual abuse, ultimately we need to accept the person as a uh, complete human being uh, in front of us. We need to always remember that we should probably strive to talk less. If you're doing motivational interviewing like I'm doing this webinar, it probably won't work very well. But we should also be aware of something that exists within us called the writing reflex that kind of underlying temptation or a compulsion to go and set the record straight or to fix somebody else's problems or to give advice. Giving advice only with permission, with the client's permission, is actually the big fifth uh, micro skill of motivational interviewing as of the most recent book uh, that came out in, um, uh, in 2013. There's also the Michelangelo belief, which holds that within all of our clients, uh, within all of our clients are all the strengths and uh, positive attributes that they will ever need. Our job is to liberate and to build those strengths over time, much as Michelangelo did with the statue of David. He often said he didn't create David. He merely uh, liberated uh, David from the, uh, from the rock with his hammer and chisel. And then, of course, there's the, uh, um, the principles of autonomy and choice. Tying many of these threads together, I have a brief uh, story that I always tell of my son, Keith. He's old enough that I had to get his permission to tell this story. Uh, but that when he was about five years old, he um, developed a foot infection and he needed uh, to get toe cream placed between his little toes. And five-year-olds can be pretty sensitive about this. He didn't want it. Um, my poor wife, um, realizing that she was married to a motivational interviewing trainer, um, tried to persuade him with the promise of a better life. Uh, he said no. He started to kick his feet. He started to scream. And um, she finally developed uh, the idea of maybe what I need to do, and this 
really was a, an act of um, crazy, brilliant genius was she went into the uh, into the bathroom and came back with a, a Dixie cup filled with Q-tips and said, Keith, we're going to have to do this somehow. But my, my question is, which of these Q-tips do you think I should use? And in that one moment, she had managed to become the person who respected his autonomy and provided uh, choices at a time when it seemed that all other choices had been taken away. So these are some of the fundamental uh, aspects or core elements or perhaps core competencies of motivational interviewing that I think all too often get lost um, in our discussions. The other fundamental place to start is with strengths. Motivational interviewing is inherently strengths-based. Um, if we had all day, I would uh, probably start with uh, um, a, a broader discussion, but let me just um, introduce you to a case summary. This comes directly from an email from Steve Rolnick, one of uh, uh, motivational interviewing's chief uh, proponents and authors. He describes a woman who's 46, has two children, is on her second marriage. Um, he uses the words grossly obese for many years. She leads an inactive life. She's a moderate to heavy drinker, smokes a lot, uh, has a diet that's high in fried food with very little fruit and vegetables. And I like to ask audiences, how much do you want to work um, with this client? And people um, tend to look at the, uh, at the slide and say, I'm, uh, I'm reserved, or words to that effect. Whereas I then offer a, a different case summary. Um, it's a 46-year-old account manager and the mother of two. She's very determined on her second marriage, and she keeps a keen eye on her children's well-being. It's a happy house. They work and play hard. She has lots of friends, smokes and drinks in the pub, doesn't uh, have much time for exercise, likes to make sure everybody's happy and comfortable, and that includes a nice, uh, good filling meal with lots of fried food. And you've probably gotten by now that this is the same client uh, as the, uh, the first uh, case summary that I just showed. Our job is to go looking for the strengths. That's what we should do. We should be the people who go out and people watch, but instead of finding nice catty remarks to, to make about people, we should be the ones sitting at the, uh, the bus station or the airport or the restaurant trying to find the strengths in people and strangers as they walk past us. If you can do that, if you can find four strengths for every catty remark that you make, you'll be uh, in a pretty good uh, condition to move on. A little bit closer to home, let's consider the case of Dan, who's 52, diagnosed with pedophilia, reoffended at the age of 40. His victims were unrelated males that he met while working as a middle school music teacher. He is gay and has been in a marital type relationship for eight years. I wrote some of this in the language of risk assessment and took a case specifically designed to raise the anxiety of uh, many people uh, in an average audience. Um, this is a real case and uh, looking at him from another angle, we see that he's uh, 52 and a composer of modern classical music, having recently completed an opera based on local historical incidents uh, involving the, uh, the murder of a gay man about 30 years ago, a very tragic case. He has convictions for abusing young unrelated males while working as a contracted music teacher in a middle school. He's active in efforts to legalize gay marriage in his state, and the connections that he's developed along the way are very important to him. Uh, he's been in a marital type relationship for, uh, for eight years with a man who was five years older and active in the local arts scene. And I would ask you, could you work with this person, whatever your uh, musical tastes uh, might be, notwithstanding? Uh, this is an actual case, and in fact, um, the uh, opera that he wrote uh, won some rather uh, won a prestigious uh, uh, award. And so, it's all in how you look at the uh, at the uh, the client. Um, this is a picture of somebody I just pulled off uh, the internet, and I like to show it to audiences simply to say, "Let's go, let's talk about what strengths you see." And people typically say, "Well, she's confident, she has a friendly expression, um, she's dressed very professionally." Uh, things of this nature. One person in Virginia observed um, that she uh, is not uh, afraid to allow her hair to uh, uh, to go gray. 
uh, something that I could relate to uh, quite a bit. But in the spirit of finding the strengths, you could also say that if she did dye her hair, that um, that uh, that this shows that she takes a very great uh, amount of pride in her appearance. So for all you know, you might have somebody walking in through your door and you need to be able to find the strengths in order to build rapport with them in a very short period of time. Likewise, here's a, uh, a picture of a man. Many audiences uh, uh, say he's patient, he looks wise, he's not afraid to wear a hat that most of us might feel um, uh, quite ambivalent about. Um, that uh, he seems to, um, as I said, be patient as he's engaged in what I believe is face painting with a, um, with a young girl. And what I find when I show this to audiences is that they really have to sit on their hands and bite their tongues because many of us who've been through very risk-based training um, conclude, um, well, uh, he could be um, a child molester. He could be uh, setting her up so that he could abuse her, we have this sort of a writing reflex response to these kinds of pictures. And it's very easy to jump to the risks without actually seeing the strengths. Similarly, here are two teenage girls. It usually takes people a little while to say they're out in the community, they're enjoying themselves, they're obviously connected, they're enjoying a good uh, relationship with one another, or so it seems. A one particularly cynical audience said that they thought they were um, prostitutes. If this is the sort of thing that crosses your mind, I would say that you probably have a very good um, eye for risk and that I guess one of the morals of the story of the development of our field is that we've gotten really good at risk assessment. Now we need get to get back to the basics of strength assessment. Similarly, this man, young man looks rather, uh, you might say that he looks moody, or you could say he looks pensive, thoughtful, contemplative. Um, I would never wear those uh, pink uh, Converse sneakers myself, but I celebrate the fact that he's willing to do so, that he marches to the beat of his own drummer, et cetera. Here's a woman. Um, some people notice that she's uh, carrying a Neiman Marcus shopping bag and therefore has exquisite taste. Um, she looks as though she's not going to take any nonsense from anybody. Um, she has many strengths that we could um, that we could appeal to and that we could connect to in a very short period of time. Here's a photograph of a woman, obviously with uh, um, a high degree or high priority on on um, creativity and artwork, et cetera. And I think you get the idea. And even this rather tipsy looking fellow looks like he could be entertaining, enjoys a nice sense of humor. Uh, and so on and so forth. I mention all of these things because we never know when we're going to be face to face with somebody that truly pushes our buttons. And I know that showing Adolf Hitler is a rather ridiculous example, but I do think that sometimes we need to prepare ourselves for the, uh, for the very worst and to be able to, if we're going to do this work, to find the strengths in anybody. I might add that many people look at a picture like this, Muhammad Atta, the 9-11 hijacker, and say, enough is enough, David, I could never work with these people, and to which I say that's fine. Um, and this is precisely why we have ethical codes around referring out uh, clients that we don't believe that we can work with. Some audiences uh, comment that this was a person with a, uh, an unshakable commitment to his beliefs, um, efficiency of operations, and so on and so forth. And I realize that this is a little bit extreme, but sometimes this is simply the work that we have to do. So motivational interviewing is typically defined as a person-centered counseling style for addressing the common problem of ambivalence about change. There are more technical definitions uh, saying that it's collaborative and goal-oriented with particular attention to the language of change designed to strengthen personal motivation by eliciting and exploring the person's own reasons for change within an atmosphere of acceptance and compassion. And um, Oops, I just realized I went backwards. My apologies. It relies on a fundamental spirit of partnership and acceptance and compassion and evocation. 
And anybody that ever went to kindergarten remembers the poster that says everything I need to know about getting on in life, I learned in kindergarten. And I would say that we all know about partnership, acceptance, and compassion, but that going about our business in a perpetual state of curiosity about what is this person's internal reasons and motivation for change can be a real practice skill that can take many years to develop. Motivational interviewing as of 2013 involves four processes, engaging your client. And in fact, I'll say a helpful hint, a helpful tip is to spend the first 20% of any session. That's the first 12 minutes of each session, really just working to engage your client. I don't mean idle chit chat or talking sports scores. I mean, fully engaging and understanding their perspective and joining up with them focusing on what the uh, the change goal actually is, which as we all know can, can change sometimes from week to week. This is why we have an options menu to offer choices. Evoking their own internal reasons for change. And then finally coming up with some sort of a change plan. These processes can be linear, but they can also go uh, back and forth. We always want to keep our clients engaged through every minute of every session to the greatest degree possible, but human beings tend to go back and second guess their goals. And you might find that as somebody starts to plan for how they might do things differently to attain a goal, that they realize it's not the right goal for them after, after all. Many of our clients simply want to be happy. And as we try to define that goal, it gets a little bit harder. Ultimately, the most recent iterations of, of motivational interviewing involve uh, really listening to the language of change. Some people want to sustain the way that they are uh, living. Others want uh, to uh, change. Others are committed to some kind of change. But perhaps the greatest difference between motivational interviewing and other forms of therapy is that in this way of thinking, there's simply no such thing as resistance, that the whole concept of resistance is broken down into either the language of staying the same or the language of discord, which means that we uh, don't yet have a relationship with our client, not the one that we need. In other words, I'm not gonna and you can't make me, which is common teenager talk, um, is a combination of both. I don't want to change and I don't have the relationship with you where I feel uh, safe even talking about it. So here we have the, the four corners of change talk, desire, ability, reason, and need. And I'm gonna just argue that when we hear this kind of language, our first response, our first thought should be, tell me more. We should offer affirmations, reflective statements, and summarize what the language of change actually is. So for example, with Amy Winehouse, it could be, you really don't ever want to drink again. And the thing that would help you the most is if you really had a friend who you knew you could trust. So the four basic skills up until 2013, open questions, affirmations, reflective statements, summarizing what your client has said and offering advice without giving advice. In other words, seeking permission or offering advice only when it's asked. Reflective listening can include simple and complex reflections, feeding back somebody's exact words or closely related words. Or you might even find yourself saying, should I reflect back the emotion that I'm hearing in their voice? Or should I reflect back what I believe is the meaning? Um, I've spent some time in Europe recently, and very often audiences say, ah, so what you mean by reflective listening is an interpretation. And my thinking is always what my friend Alan Zukov says, which is a good reflection always says more than the client says, but never more than what they actually mean. So that is what I have to say, and I think if I'm understanding correctly, that we might uh, be just on time. So uh, Greg, Steve, Nas, I'm gonna turn it over to you for whatever questions there are. Great, David, thank you. And uh, uh, just to uh, to say that, that uh, sometimes I feel like what we're finding our way back to is uh, we're finding our way back to um, when everybody's ever known about therapy and forgot when the behavior became sexual abuse. 
drifting back to the research that always said the things that you're saying. So we're finding our way back to compassion and connection and relationship and support and all those wonderful things. So it's just great to hear you speak. But that gets me to a question. And by the way, if you're out there and you haven't posted a question and you would like to, then uh, please feel free to um, type it in and we'll see if we can get to you uh, or, or not. Um, but I have one that just says, I've been using a uh, uh, facilitating a group from a curriculum that states, quote, sexual assault is a crime of violence, having more to do with control and inflicting injury upon the victim than the sexual act itself. And the question is, is the curriculum outdated? And uh, could you full screen the Q&A slide, Steve? Yeah, thank you. Ah, uh, very good. Okay, there. that was an excellent question, and there are many moving parts uh, to that question. Um, I've, I've worked, I've spent much of my career working with truly dangerous people, I should say that from the outset, um, who've inflicted real harm and uh, for whom uh, many of the people they abused um, didn't survive. So when I think about terms like power and control, I guess um, in some ways I would say, yeah, I feel it's a little bit outdated because we need to break these things down into um, into sort of more manageable, uh, more manageable concepts. Steve, I might ask you to repeat some parts of the question since there were so many, uh, so many aspects to it. If all we think about is violent crime and sexual abuse as a violent crime, we're going to miss some very important risk factors. One of those um, would be something like adversarial attitudes towards women or intimacy deficits where this is a person who's not able to build and sustain meaningful relationships. Now, without minimizing the harm or the violence and knowing that even one sexual crime is one crime too many. I might say that a place to join up with this client is to really examine how they have had relationships, uh, for example, with women. Now, I'm choosing this. This sounds like a sexual, uh, a sort of more rape-specific um, uh, example. Um, I would be looking at this person's capacity for building relationships, um, talking with them about that meaningfully, um, and then examining the implicit theories that they view the world with um, that, uh, that has led them to conclude that women are deceitful, say no when they mean yes, um, and all of the other kinds of uh, risk factors that are uh, involved um, uh, in this uh, sort of overall kind of a, approach to sexual crime. Likewise, with child molesters, I think if we're in some cases not understanding that sometimes uh, for these clients that that um, that this is the closest uh, way that they've experienced uh, an intimate relationship. I'm not saying that the behavior um, is acceptable in any uh, in any way, but that if we can't can't find our way into talking about those aspects of their relationships, we're actually going to be missing the boat. So um, I, I would say there's a lot of excellent curricula out there and to, uh, uh, to go out um, and um, uh, do a little bit of homework. Feel free to contact me or, or Neri or, or anyone about any of that. I'm happy to respond to emails about that. Um, but I've tended to stop thinking purely in the power and control box, and I've thought about the individual components that make up the sex crime and the pathways to that sex crime. So maybe a longer answer than you wanted, Steve, but that's it. That's fine. Thank you. Here's another question for you. What are the top reasons that are usually given for internal motivation for change? Wow. Wow. Um, it, <laughs> that's um, okay. Whoever that was gets the, today's award for the stump the chump, uh, the stump the chump question. I think a lot of times internal motivations have something to do with acquiring some sense of peace of mind, for establishing some sense of competence within relationships, in the sense of okay, look, I've tried everything else to be competent within relationships, and it didn't work. So now I'm just gonna, I'm, I'm gonna be mean. That's maybe oversimplifying. Amplified. Um, very often people don't know how to get what they want out of relationships and don't have the skills to prevent themselves from doing truly stupid and harmful stuff when they uh, get upset, angry, or anxious. 
Um, in some cases, um, people want to abuse because of a motivation to um, to be part of a part of a community, whether that be a community of teenagers um, or college students or what have you. It's an excellent question, and that's the best I got for right now. And by the way, I'm drawing my answer uh, from the uh, so-called primary goods or common life goals of the good lives model. You know, David, just as a, a thought, I think sometimes that we overcomplicate things, which is like, what is it that motivates us to change? So I think the question is really, you know, when you made difficult changes in your life around really serious issues that you have had for a long time and that you didn't choose to change for years and years. And finally, what was it that turned you around? Was it, you know, pain? Was it that loss? Was it age was it what was it that did it and sometimes we don't look at ourselves enough i think to get the answers mm. to our own to our own questions so let me ask you one more and then we're gonna uh, have to move on i think um which is um is there an quote active ingredient in motivational interview what's the most important part Sure. So, uh, you know, I think this actually ties into the last question some. I'll just share a personal example. When I was a teenager, I went out, I played in bands, I took my bass, my bass amp, put them into the back of my dad's car, I drove to a party. The party went better than anybody expected. We played longer than anybody expected. And I came home probably three and a half hours after my curfew. I came home to a dark house. I thought I'd gotten away with things. And um, I was going to sneak back in and hope that nobody noticed. Um, what, what can I say? I was a teenager. Um, I walked into the dark living room and there was my father and he was furious. And uh, I was grounded for a month. I don't think I could drive his car. I forget what the heck happened. But I didn't, um, I didn't uh, stay out past curfew after that. I changed. Now, why did I change? It wasn't the curfew that made the difference. For me, the active ingredient in that was I had never seen my father like that, that there was a relationship quality to all of this, that I'd finally seen my father truly disappointed and frustrated. When I think about the why of change and going back to the original, what I've come to call the Georgia question, uh, I think about um, we change because there's a difference between where we want to be, uh, where we are and where we want to be. And we have some idea that change is possible and then people change within a relationship experience where hope and possibility are reborn. So if I was to say, what's the active ingredient in motivational interviewing? I would say it's the relationship. Great. David, thank you. I've got some housekeeping to do at the end of the webinar and inform people. So we're going to move uh, onward and I'll get back to you in just a minute. Um, sure. Just to let you know, we do have a free e-newsletter, Research to Practice, that you can sign up that David and Joan and I produce every month. So if you haven't, please let us know and sign yourself up for that. Um, I want to tell you about our next webinar. We're very excited about it. It's and called Engaging Bystanders in Sexual Violence Prevention. And Joan Tabachnik, our very close colleague, will be presenting that. And I really encourage you to attend briefly the basic information in the webinar will be helpful to anyone concerned about preventing sexual violence or working professionally in the field with either survivors or those who have uh, caused the harm. And it's based upon the free book entitled Engaging Bystanders in Sexual Violence Prevention that Joan wrote for the National Sexual Violence Resource Center. And if uh, if you haven't had the pleasure of, of uh, knowing Joan or her work, she is really a very large thought leader in the field around uh, prevention and bystander work and is now working uh, for the federal government as well. So um, I hope you all will uh, come and join us on December 16th, 2014. Um, I also want to thank our sponsors. I'm going to read them through because we wouldn't be able to do this without their support. The Center for Clinical and Forensic Services, the ITM group, James Reynolds, the Massachusetts Department of Mental Health, Maple Tree Group Homes, New Hope Treatment Centers, Ranch Erlo Society, Stevens Treatment Program, Wayne County Juvenile Probation Department, Yerrick Counseling, Houston Transitions to Wellness and Counseling Incorporated. We do this list every time because we really are so grateful and I would love to be adding some of your names to it. I don't care how long it takes me to read it. So if you can become a sponsor, we really encourage you um, to do that. 
Um, and um, if you want to uh, sponsor, contact us at uh, information, uh, info at nearypress.org or call us at 413-540-0712, extension 14. And, and finally, uh, you know, if you need a certificate of attendance, uh, just wait and then the link to one will be sent to you next week when we announce that the recording has been posted. Once again, CE credits are available. Go to the webinar page to find the link to take post-assessment uh, test and the link to purchase CEs. And please, please, please evaluate, um, do the evaluation form because we learn a lot from you and it helps us enrich each of our, our webinars. And a link will be sent to you at sign off. And finally, just a really big thank you to David. David, you're always, um, pushing the edge of the envelope for people, introducing concepts that may not be comfortable but need to be said. You're a wealth of information. You always know the research, which is so comforting, so there isn't the kind of fear that, wow, there's something out there that would disclaim everything that someone is saying. You're a wonderful resource to the field, both in these webinars, as a colleague in the press, and in all the work that you do. So thank you so very much. I want to thank everyone who's been on the webinar. Uh, uh, you know, we value each and every one of you. Hope you come back uh, often. And um, that's it for today. Thank you very much. Bye-bye right, now. You.